Oh, good morning, everyone. We are about to, to start the, the course with about five years. And to begin, we have the talk of Hickson. Hickson has graduate, graduated in physics at the University of Campinas, Luton. He obtained his master and PhD at the same university. His PhD thesis was the first to employ near infrared spectroscopy methods for neuroscience applications in Brazil. Professor Mesquita worked at the Massachusetts General Hospital and was an associate research at the University of Pennsylvania. Currently, Professor Mesquita is a professor of the Institute of Physics at Unicamp, where he founded the Biomedical Optics Lab. Since 2011, the lab developed research on light transport through highly scattered media and built optical technologies for biomedical applications, such as the study of the brain and cancer. Professor Mesquita has published several articles in the field, both for peers and for the public, and holds two patents that explore novel methods for near-infrared light in biological tissue. He is a member of the Education Committee of the Society for Functional Near-Infrared Spectroscopy and Associate Editor for, of Neurophotonics. So, Hickson, we, we can start the talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to start thanking the invitation to, to speak uh, at this course. And uh, I guess I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, or what I plan to do, is to talk a little bit about the neuroscience uh, at the individual level with my peers. Right? So on the way, what I plan is actually just to give you a kind of general and basic uh, overview of FDR's method towards the, the goal uh, of imaging a single individual at the single subject lab, right? So, and that's part of what uh, we've been doing and we've been working on in the past few years in our lab, okay? So in the meantime, I, I feel free, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them and, and and Danielle, please feel free to interrupt me uh, whenever you need, okay? And on, or whenever you have a question. So, so, so let's go. I'll, I'll try to provide you a lot of uh, information and general overview. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, I'm happy to to discuss with you any specific uh, topic that I that I'll show you. Okay. So I guess I don't need to convince this audience uh, uh, about the importance and 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 this uh, of the field of the neuroscience in general, right? Uh, but I just kind of brought here a few aspects of neuroscience. One is from 10 years ago uh, when the Human Brain Project was launched at, uh, uh, in the US and the Scientific American had a great uh, uh, cover on this. And, uh, and at that time they were actually talking about changing the way we study the brain, right? So typically we always see neuroimaging as kind of one branch of different fields and, and, and it's mostly biology that we can use kind of a physics or statistics or mathematics in general to understand the brain, and, uh, but always from one single perspective. Uh, the things that basically that doesn't work for the brain and uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit more on this, right? Eric Kandel, which is a, who's a famous uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner on the field, uh, just uh, I'm just going to quote here for him saying uh, that uh, I guess science and medicine uh, in the 21st century will be transformed as we unlock the mysteries of the mind, 
right, which is part of the neuroscience efforts uh, nowadays. And uh, with that, with all the money, funding, and researchers putting a lot of effort on this, the number of publications and, and knowledge uh, acquired with these publications have been exponentially growing. Right? So basically, in order to study the brain, we can do that uh, at different scales, at different spatial scales, right? So we can do that from the chemistry and, and biological level, uh, studying the neurotransmitters and the cells that are there and what the cells are doing and how they are connected. And we can go all the way up to the system level, to the regional level with the macroscopic regions and, and the whole brain and how these regions interact with each other, right? And I guess regardless of the scale, what we can fairly agree is uh, the detail structure is quite well known, right? And always the function of the structure is also well known. We know the cells in the brain, we know how they work, we know they function, we know the neurotransmitters that are released, we know the different regions that we have in the brain, and we know how these regions are connected to function, right? Or how specific regions are connected to function. What we really don't know is how these structures integrate with each other and collaborate with each other and cooperate with each other to provide a better description of higher cognition and the higher processes in the brain, right? So we know how one neuron works, but we don't know how they actually work or they collaborate and they work together to provide uh, uh, a complicated or a more complex brain function or to develop or things like that, right? So really what we are mostly interested in modern neuroscience, I would say, and mainly in the past decade or so, is trying to understand how different brain regions, how different cells uh, can integrate and can collaborate with each other to provide a uh, function that we know and we take it for granted, like uh, memory or, I mean, any cognition task or, or, or any higher order process, right? And in the search to actually try to find the answers for this, what we typically do is, uh, what we what is called a functional neuroimaging experiments, at least at the macroscopic level, right? So the idea is basically you have one baseline condition and then you have a task. Uh, most of the times you have a task, you can do that also with only baseline conditions. Uh, and the problem with neuroimaging techniques is actually they have very low signal choice ratio. So you are really trying to find one very small signal in a lot of noise. Uh, so in order to increase your sensitivity to track brain function uh, that's correlated with a task, what we typically do is actually we provide a lot of different trials of this task, right? And, and, and we map this over time and try, we try at the end to come up with these activation maps. So the idea behind it is kind of what this video shows, right? So. And, and, and so you, you do have here, I'm showing FNIRs, uh, but you can have a neuroimaging technique. And as for a moment you start a task, you can see regions in the brain that are related to this task. For a moment it stops, you can see that uh, these regions stop as well. And you change the task from, for example, right finger tapping to left finger tapping. What you see is that different regions of the brain uh, will shine and will change over time. The signal from these regions will change. Right. So this is typically what we are interested in neuroimaging techniques to try to track brain function at the microscopic level. Right. And we can actually do that with a lot of different techniques. Right. I guess EEG is the most well known. fMRI has probably uh, picking up this, this title from EEG in the past few decades. Uh, and there's, of course, uh, different methods with optics, right, that we generally call optical imaging. And uh, these different techniques have different time resolutions or spatial resolutions. So depending on where or what you are trying to track, maybe one technique may be more suitable than the other. Uh, so to understand your problem, what is the answer you are trying, or the problem you are trying to solve and, and, and the approach that, uh, that you take to, to provide an answer to this problem uh, at really uh, demands of different techniques. Right. It may demand a different technique, right? 
if we actually zoom in just in the optical imaging technique, we still have a lot of different techniques, right? So we have uh, techniques that work at the microscopic level, like two photon, confocal, optical coherence tomography, laser speckle, photoacoustics. So these are techniques that actually provide a really nice spatial resolution that can image uh, what's going on at the microscopic scale. If you want to try to provide an answer at the macroscopic level, we do have a couple of different techniques, right? So I guess the most famous one is near infrared spectroscopy, or that we typically call NEARS. Uh, it's not the only one, so we do have other different techniques like diffuse correlation spectroscopy, uh, which provides a, 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 a imaging of blood flow. NEARS is most uh, uh, concerned about uh, oxygenation in the brain, right? So, and, and the reason this works is basically because uh, the near infrared light, well, different. you have in tissue different uh, molecules that can absorb and interact with this light, right? And in the near infrared light, I guess the molecules that actually absorb more light as hemoglobin, both oxygenated hemoglobin as, uh, and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So uh, because hemoglobin is the main absorber in the near infrared, uh, all the information that you track with near infrared light and therefore with NEARS is the oxygenation status of the tissue. Right. And this is useful to track brain, brain function because most of the times uh, oxygenation is directly related to the neural activity through neurovascular function. Right? So this is a direct experiment that we did over 10 years ago uh, and in an animal right, uh, model, whisker barrel stimulation rats. And you see that every time we have a whisker barrel stimulation, we do see electrophysiology response in these rats. And uh, as a response to this electrophysiology, you see an increase in blood flow, an increase in oxyhemoglobin, a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin. And if you sum the oxy and the oxy, oxy and the oxyhemoglobin, you have total hemoglobin, which could be a proxy for uh, blood volume in tissue. So you, you, in this case, you always see you all you also see an increase in total hemoglobin uh, concentration, right? So this is typically called the characteristic hemodynamic response or the hemodynamic response function uh, related to brain function. Every time you have one brain region uh, that is working, right, uh, for whatever reason, what you typically see is an increase in oxygenation and a decrease in the oxygenation, uh, which you can uh, measure directly with NEARS. Uh, you can also see other uh, parameters like you can see an increase in flow, but you won't see that with years. Uh, you need a different technique for that. So, so basically, uh, we use this to track. Uh, we can use this oxygenation, right? Mostly oxy and the oxyhemoglobin concentration in tissue in the brain to actually uh, uh, image brain function or to track brain function with years, right? And this is a very uh, appealing technique, uh, not because of how it works, but because of all the kind of features that comes uh, with the with the technique per se, right? First of all, we are using lights, near infrared lights, so that doesn't uh, pose any danger in tissue. So it's basically non-ionizing radiation. We don't need an exogenous contrast. Uh, it's a very portable technique. So it's very easy to kind of perform a lot of different experiments because you can bring the instrument uh, to the subject unlike, for example, MRI or PET, where you need to bring the subject to the instrument, right? It's a technique that it's very flexible uh, and that uh, has an important feature, which is relatively sensitive to motion. So that allows you to perform experiments where motion is there all the time. For example, when you try to image infants or neonates, they move a lot uh, and, and, and therefore it's really hard to make an experiment uh, with uh, techniques that are very sensitive to motion. Uh, NEARS, it is sensitive to motion, to motion, but it's less sensitive to motion. So, so that allows you to um, image kids, infants, or even uh, neonates, right? And uh, of course, there's another point which is related to price, right? So compared to most of other neuroimaging techniques available so far, NEARS is not that expensive. Uh, 
So these actually features are features that open new opportunities uh, in a lot of different fields. And, uh, and that kind of attracts a lot of people, a lot of uh, people interested, a lot of scientists interested in uh, uh, looking at neuroscience towards NEOs, right? And uh, typically that's what we, we go for, right? So we do have an experimental protocol and data collection. Whenever we decided we want to use NEOs, we know which experiment we want to do. And therefore we just prepare a protocol for that and we prepare all the data collection and a lot of effort is typically put that uh, 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 it's typically put in the in this in, in this in these activities, right? Uh, but that's really the beginning of the journey, right? Uh, and from this experimental protocol and data collection to all the results you get with NFNIRS and the interpretation you pro, you give to these results and the hypothesis testing the hypothesis testing that you make. There's a long journey on the way, right? And there's a lot of things uh, that you need to be aware on it. FNIRS is not a plug and play technique, right? Which you just press a button, collect some data, and then you have an answer and, uh, and, and you are fine, right? So uh, I guess at the bottom line, I guess at the end of the day, no neuroimaging technique is like that, right? Plug and play. Some of them are easier uh, to, to run this journey, probably because it's uh, older or you have more scientists working on it. Uh, but even with these techniques, you shouldn't uh, uh, just run through this journey. you got to really walk and, and enjoy the journey, right? Um, there's a famous saying that life is about the journey and not the final destination. So it's really through the journey that you learn and, and, and you, bear, you get familiar uh, with these techniques, right? And, 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 and this is really important because at the end, uh, the result of what we see may be biased towards what we want to see, right? So I, I always like to bring this picture. It's a famous picture, it's a famous drawing, right? And uh, because I guess some of the people may have seen two, uh, uh, two kids, I don't know, two teenagers uh, or two adults, or, uh, um, bathing in the lake or uh, but some of you may have seen uh, the face of an old man uh, in between right so really uh, it does depend a lot on what you want to see right and uh, and and if you really don't understand what we have between the experimental protocol that we really want to do with FNIRS and the results that we hope to get, uh, you may be biased towards seeing either one or the other, right? Towards accepting or refuting or your hypothesis, right? And generally, we are mostly concerned about accepting our hypothesis, right? And not refuting. Yeah. And, and, and I'll give you just a couple of examples where our gut can be really uh, betrayed by the results in FNIR's results specifically, right? So this is, for example, one uh, very interesting experiment that we formed uh, a few years ago, uh, along with uh, researchers at the uh, medical school in, in the university, uh, university, Federal University in Minas Gerais, UFMG. Uh, and we were actually measuring premature, uh, uh, we, well, we are trying to, they were trying to understand prematurity and, and how prematurity affects the sensory motor de uh, development, right? So we performed a very simple test, the sensory motor test, Stimulation in, in six month old infants, so they are really uh, uh, young. Uh, it's a really young sample, right? And we did find a very interesting activation profile that I show here in these black circles, right? Uh, so you do see a contralateral response around the sensory motor cortex. Uh, sometimes the group response uh, also is, uh, shows a robust change in the in the ipsilateral activation. The premature had a different uh, aspect, aspect and a different degree of activation, but it generally shows also a sensory motor activation uh, or an activation in a sensory motor cortex. The problem is if you get this group response and if you look at the, the, the curves, uh, which is a unique feature, nears you can measure the hemodynamic changes, right? You don't need to assume them as uh, people, for example, in fMRI need to. But, uh, so basically, 
you see something that makes a lot of sense, and that's a really robust group response. And then we actually look at the data and made a very simple question. How many infants showed the response that we were seeing for the group? And the answer is zero. Out of the 51 subjects or infants that we measured, no one had a similar pattern that the group response showed. Okay? So uh, even if you have a group level robust result, that doesn't mean anything to any single subject. You, you may learn something about the, uh, the experiment it, itself, but you don't learn anything about the subject itself, right? And we do have a couple of different uh, experiments, not only with the NEARS, right? This is another experiment that we performed with, not with NEARS, with DCS, which is a similar technique, but measure, uh, it's, a, it's an optical technique, but measure blood flow. Uh, and we were measuring head of bed manipulation in, in stroke patients. And what we see is actually, well, we do see a change that it's really nice. The group response shows an, an, an increase in flow as you decrease the head of bed. But if you look at every single individual, you have a lot of variability. And in fact, for some of the subjects, blood flow decreased uh, as you decrease the head of bed angle, right? Which is something that uh, it's not really uh, every stroke management at the hospital assumes that uh, this will not happen. So in some cases, what we are showing here basically is that you are worsening the condition of the patient uh, by trying to decrease the head of bed, which is a typically management, uh, it's a typical management that people do in the clinic, right? Uh, the same idea uh, goes with another patient, which is basically, uh, uh, we were trying to quotify the delay in the hemodynamic response in carotid arteriosis patients. Uh, and what we see is actually a really nice response for uh, these patients. But if you look at the whole, at the individual level, none, no patient had the median delay that we quantified, right? Every patient had a completely different profile and that actually correlates with their clinical measurements. Uh, so the group response is not, is of is of no use here or no, it doesn't provide any insightful information here besides the obvious that, uh, I mean, occluded vessels will have a delay in the transit time uh, of, of flow. Okay. And this is also not only specific about FNIRS, right? So uh, this is an experiment of bold fMRI uh, where they, it's from a long time ago, 20 years ago, and if you look at, they were doing a cognitive task with recognition and the group response shows a really nice uh, response, a really nice voxel response right around the, the left uh, uh, cortex, uh, uh, the auditory cortex, right? And, and, uh, and Broca's area. But if you look at every single individual, it does have a completely different activation profile. So the group response doesn't inform you anything about the specific response of every single individual. In fact, the correlation across the, the, the uh, uh, among the different individuals is very low, very, very low, right? And even the same individual, the individual with the same individual itself in two different runs has a very low correlation. So that tells you, and that should at least raise a, uh, raise a yellow flag, right? So what really are we measuring? Is that anything useful there? Right. If you if you have a lot of variability, even the subject with the subject itself, right? What really does that mean, right? And and what information can you extract from this, right? And uh, we we've seen that a couple of times ago also for a few years. This is an experiment that we did the same subject, right? So we if you get a subject to do a very easy uh, task like finger tapping, right? Uh, you see that the group response shows a really nice. Uh, activation profile, but if you get the same individual and perform the same experiment at three different times of the day or three completely different days, you get completely different responses, right? So really there's a lot of variability at both the inter-subject and also the intra-subject level, right? And with this variability, that raises a lot of questions, right? So can you, for example, the, the, the one that we raised in our lab is, can we trust one to studies, right? Uh, if I look at an infant data at six months, and then look at, again, at 12 months, right? Uh, and I see any changes. How can I be sure this is related to development 
and not related to the variability that I've seen, that I've, I'm showing you that there exists, right? So this is something that we really need, we really wanted to, because in my opinion, it's not worth it to do any experiment if you don't really understand this, right? Uh, uh, otherwise, you can question whatever result you're getting, right? So that's something that we actually dig deep and very deep across the past. I don't know, decade in our lab and say, well, can we actually make it at least the results more reproducible? And I, I think that this is the important part, right? So if science cannot be reproducible, uh, there's something really wrong that we should uh, stop and, and, and think about it, right? So the way we did it was looking at all the different details, the process and the steps uh, related to mirror imaging and to FMIRS data collection and analysis, right? So I'm just simplifying the whole process, right? But doing an FMIRS experiment goes all the way from defining which regions you want to probe, right? So unlike uh, fMRI, where you are always imaging the brain, uh, the whole brain, with FMIRS, you are always limited or constrained by the number of sources and detectors you have. And, and after you define that, you do uh, have to make measurements. Uh, and data quality is a really important issue there. As I mentioned before, any mirror imaging technique, including FMIRS, has a very low signal compared to all the noise. Uh, so make sure that you are collecting good signals is important. Uh, there are a lot of things on the way, like artifacts on, uh, related to motion. There are a lot of things related to uh, the hemodynamic response and the systemic physiology behind it. There's a lot of ways that you can treat the data uh, before you actually get an answer, right? So there's there's a lot of steps and we can actually question them uh, a lot, right? And and I'll just give you some simple ideas that are actually, to me, the most important ones that people need to think about it, right? So the first one is avoid uh, motion whenever possible, but when it's not possible to avoid motion, like for example, you're measuring infants, uh, you've got to know how to deal with it, right? Just don't ignore it. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the sake of time, but yes, nowadays there are algorithms that you can use to correct motion artifacts. This is one algorithm that uh, we come up with in our lab and where we quantify it, all the effects, all the different types of motion that can have that a, an FMIR signal can have, and we developed ways to correct them. And, and we validated that in our recent task, showing that we do see what's expected to see, it's reproducible, and, uh, and not only the spatial activation regions, but also the temporal uh, responses are very reproducible as well at the group level. Right. Uh, but so that's one very small thing that you need to care of, you need to take care of. And, Studies from 10 years ago, we're not really concerned about this. So be careful when you read them as well, right? Because uh, uh, old studies, uh, as any technique that is growing, and it's growing exponentially, there's a lot of things being developed over time. So just be careful uh, uh, with the studies that you are were, you were reading. And of course, with the studies that you plan to do, right? The second step, and the second important thing, and I guess one of the most important things is actually you need to understand the physiology underlying the measurement and not the protocol behind it, right? And uh, this is very important, uh, specifically for FMIRS. I told you that the, the signal is very low compared to the noise. And uh, one of the things that we need to appreciate is actually most of the noise is not instrumental. On the, it's on the other hand, right? So we do have wonderful companies that have been producing wonderful instruments uh they're very accurate and very reliable but the, it, no matter how reliable your instrument is and and you do have a lot of uh variability that it's related to the measurement right so for example mirrors uh measures right you get the signal from the from the scalp uh but there's a lot of things in between the cortex which you try to use you yeah, measure it, right, uh, to target brain function and the scalp. And uh, there are a lot of vessels there, which has a lot of uh, uh, hemoglobin there as well. And therefore, they will affect your signal, right? So 
it's not only the signal related to the neurovascular coupling, you have a lot of different artifacts and mechanisms that will affect the neuroimaging signal as well, right? And I guess the major one is systemic factors. And it gets a little bit more tricky because if you look at the uh, uh, brain physiology, you see that most of the potential for control hemoglobin and, and flow in general comes from the systemic factors, right? And not for the cortical vertex. So you're imaging something that's not really controlling many things, just being controlled by the potential control, right? And this has a lot of uh, effects on this. I'm not gonna go into the details, but I'm just showing here. It's a really nice experiment uh, from uh, Elizabeth Hillman's group in Colombia, where they show that blood pressure can drive the response that you measure with NEARS, right? In both ways. Uh, uh, with blood pressure going up, you see a kind of really nice response that mimics the hemodynamic response function. And when blood pressure goes down, you see the negative response that some people report, right? So this is not neurovascular coupling at all. It's just blood pressure changes that NEARS are measuring. And we, most of the times, if you're not careful with it, you just take it as a kind of brain activation, right? And that uh, has a lot of effects. I'm, I'm not gonna go into details, but it has a lot of effects uh, related to development studies, right? And uh, as NEARS developed over kind of the past uh, uh, years, ways to work around this, right? And I guess the most standard way to work around this right now is to benefit from the light from the kind of principles of light propagation in tissue, right? So we know that uh, the depth we probe uh, with AFNIRS is related to the distance between the source and the detector, the infrared source and the light detector. And the longer the separation is, the deeper you probe, the shorter uh, the separation is, the shallower uh, you go, right? So we typically use this and uh, we try to perform measurements at both long separations, which will get data from the cortex that we are interested in, but also brings a lot of extra cortical data, and also from the short separations that we will only collect data from the extra cortical hemodynamics, which is basically the scalp hemodynamics itself, but also contains a lot of systemic uh, changes derived by blood pressure and cardiac pulsation and things like that, right? So, and it turns out that if you collect them separately, you can use the short separation that collects information about systemic and its couple of dynamics to regress the information uh, from the long channels and therefore try to isolate the core for hemodynamics. And that does work. Uh, we've saw that it, it does work to, to remove a lot of systemic information in, during tasks, even cognitive tasks. It does work. Uh, to remove a lot of systemic information, even in the resting state, just the baseline fluctuations. And from the moment that you actually remove this, you see that you have more reliable result, even across different subjects, right? Because now you are really tracking brain function. You're not tracking changes related to systemic physiology, right? Uh, it does really, uh, it's not kind of the last uh, decision, right? It's, it's not the ultimate uh, development because we do know that sometimes this fails. So the way we actually use this and perform the regression uh, doesn't really work under certain conditions. And this is one uh, condition that uh, uh, we are very interested in is during tasks that uh, shut up or, or, or that raise heart rate and systemic physiology correlated with the task, right? So uh, every time you have this uh, problems, you, the regression we typically perform will not work and uh, it will fail, right? So there's a lot of development to do itself, and that's something that we need to be careful, mainly if you're interested in doing experiments where we know that the subject's heart rate will go up or the subject's blood pressure will go up. And th if this is related to the past, you have a problem there. Okay. Uh, over time, we also develop uh, different ways to deal with this. Uh, one of the things that we learned is we do need uh, to keep track of uh, if you want to be view, uh, accurate and, uh, and and your result, you want your results to be reproducible at the single subject level, you need to be able to track where your probes are. So uh, we developed 
uh, over time on your navigation system that allows us to know exactly where we are before we start the experiment. And, and with that, we show that the reproducibility, the reproducibility of the results can go uh, up to 10 times higher uh, compared to not tracking that before that point. Okay. So I guess just going towards the end, right? Uh, there's a long journey between the experiment protocol and data collection and, and your APMIR results and the hypothesis testing. And in between, we need to develop new methods. And that's what we've been trying to do uh, to provide ways to come up with uh, better ways to track brain function itself and, uh, with uh, smaller contributions for a lot of co-founders. Right? So it may seem a little bit complicated, uh, but in the end, it's not. Uh, it's just a matter of being aware that these effects will affect your data, right? And uh, in the end, what I can tell you is actually there is light uh, at the end of this tunnel. And, and uh, there is a famous saying, right, from the little prince that uh, we need to endure the presence of a few caterpillars if uh, we need to, uh, if we wish to become acquainted with the butterflies, right? So no pain, no gain, maybe uh, could be a good way. And uh, just to show you which trend that in a very optimistic uh, way, if you are careful with this, uh, you can do a lot of very good things with the years, right? So I'll just show you very two simple examples. One of them is related to tracking plasticity uh, during rehabilitation, right? So this is one very, uh, remember, I'm talking about just one single subject. I'm not interested in group results, right? Uh, I guess I hope to have shown you that these group results uh, may not be very useful or very valuable uh, for questions in neuroscience, uh, in modern neuroscience, right? So if you're just looking at one single subject, it doesn't really matter how rehabilitation occurs in a group of subjects. What you want is mainly if you are this subject, what you want is this, uh, is this rehabilitation to work in you, right? So you need to be able to see that at the interest subject level. Uh, and this is one example that I performed along, uh, just before the pandemic, right? So it was one patient that uh, had a traumatic brain injury due to a car accident, and uh, it basically lost the whole uh, uh, right hemisphere. And uh, uh, what we saw is actually uh, during rehabilitation, we see this phenomenon of specialization, and we can track how does this go? And maybe that can be used to guide uh, rehabilitation, even as a feedback to rehabilitation, right? So this is something that we are really, really uh, interested in because we do think that there's a potential here uh, to improve rehabilitation outcomes, right? And this is another experiment that uh, we've performed uh, some time ago uh, during, basically we were interested in just tracking whatever it's going on in natural life, right? Real world experiments, right? What we typically call neuroergonomics now. Uh, and this is uh, one experiment during the pandemics what, uh, where uh, we tracked uh, people that were performing uh, a course, a cooking course, right? So the course had two phases, the, the lectures and, and, and the activities, right? The cooking activities. And we can actually perform and we can check uh, regions that are uh, really uh, uh, related to to this process of uh, watching and, 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 and cooking. So this may have some implications in education as well, right? And there are a lot of other things that we want to do. Uh, one experiment that we've been doing that's really interesting is how, how we think about driving, right? So this, this uh, is a very uh, common topic that it's been uh, discussed over the years. Uh, but now we do believe that we do have not only the good instrumentation to do this, but also good methodology. Sometimes we do have the instrument, with, but we do not have the conditions or the methodologies or the new methods to perform this experiment. And sometimes we have to wait uh, uh, some years to either sum up, someone come up with a solution or for us to develop a solution ourselves. Right? Uh, it's not just doing it by doing it. And, uh, and and there's a lot of things that you can do it. So hyperscanning is something that it's been 
uh, talked a lot uh, nowadays in Latin years, and, and, and things like that, right? So even with the resting state, uh, we can do things like brain fingerprinting, we can try to understand, we can try to find uh, and recognize people based on the apnea years, uh, spontaneous oscillations. And that's something that we can do up to 90% uh, accuracy uh, after removing the systemic contributions, right? People, we, we've shown recently that people can, can track 97% because they are tracking the systemic contributions and not because of brain drop. So to finish, uh, I just uh, want to uh, leave you with three, three comments or three main messages, right? So I guess neuroscience is really hot and relevant in today's uh, research, but uh, we need to, and we, need, can, we can apply that for both patients at, at, at a lot of different patient temporal scales. However, uh, we need to be careful about what we are doing and, and try to understand, right? Hardware and technology development has opened a lot of possibilities for real world experiments. Uh, but really, we need to question some things instead of just jumping in and trying to do these experiments, right? So uh, I just kind of brought up two questions, right? So uh, the, the, the validity of group results and, and also uh, the methods that we need to, to remove unwanted contributions there. And, uh, but in the end, I guess I hope to have shown that the future is exciting and very promising, if, at least with the use of imaging, if we can deal with this, right? So I'll finish this uh, just acknowledging uh, my group uh, that is really uh, who is doing all this work. I'm just coordinating uh, most of this work that I presented to you uh, and also have a lot of people from a lot of different places to, to acknowledge uh, for collaborations. Most of this data, uh, some of this data that I showed you was not really collected in our lab, but was collected in, in partners, with partners in, in different labs around the world. So with that, I went. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, you can check our website. We also have a YouTube channel and also uh, social media, both Facebook and Instagram. Uh, it's uh, LOB from Laboratorio de Optica Biomedica uh, at Unicamp. Okay. So I guess I'm right on track because we started a little bit late. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you have some. So thank you for your attention. Great talk. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Great. Uh, so we had a, a question here from the from the audience uh, at the, the room we are, and people want to know about this insens relative insensitivity to motion. Of, of epineas. Uh, are there any kind of, of movements that interfere more with the epineal signal? Uh, I guess uh, uh, basically any movement can interfere, right? So there's not one that interferes more. It really depends on the experiment. So for example, if you are doing an experiment that involves the speech, uh, the, the movement of the muscle here, temporalis muscle, uh, will affect a lot of the, uh, the signal around the temporal uh, region. Uh, if you're doing something that needs people to walk, for example, you do have a very uh, repetitive motion uh, that can affect the whole data, but mostly the frontal part of this. Uh, if you are just moving the hand or, or an experiment that is related to moving uh, uh, the head, the occipital struggles a lot with head movement and things like that. So really, uh, I guess there's, uh, it really is a specific to experiments that you are doing and to where your probe is. Yeah. And there's not a kind of good way to do it or to know about it unless I mean, there's something published in the literature before, or you are, or you do it yourself to test. Great, thank ah, uh, thanks. I I would want would, would like to know how uh, 
if the, there can be some kind of, of, of signal detection on MDs that's not related to neuronal activity, like it's related to to the heart, or to the respiration, to something like that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, all these signals are there. Uh, they may interfere more or less, depending on the experimental protocol that you have, but they will be there and they will interfere. Right? And uh, uh, heart rate, uh, as I mean, I mean, you are measuring something that is basically picking up your contrast is coming from the hemoglobin, which is inside the blood cells, which is inside blood flow. Right. So whatever changes hemodynamics, you see these changes. Right. Heart rate will pump uh, blood every. I don't know. It, it really depends. Right. In kids, it pump up to two hertz or three hertz. Uh, uh, in adults, can be one hertz. Respiration. We also modulate the amount of uh, changes. And blood pressure. Uh, you see a lot of trends from blood pressure, and there's a lot of uh, cardiac cycle and to cardiac cycle uh, in blood pressure oscillations. So yeah, they are all there in the signal. And I guess it's not only that they are there, but whatever we are collecting with mirrors is more sensitive to these changes than to changes related to brain function itself. Right. So, which means that they have more potential to drive changes than brain function, right? And in, in, well, it's not only on that near signal, basically in any uh, uh, neuroimage signal, you know, related to oxygenation, right? If you are doing uh, experiments with uh, Bolt, uh, you always have this problem as well, right? Except that with Bolt, uh, typically people do that in a very short, uh, a very long time repetition, so the temporal resolution is very low, so you don't actually see it. With FNEARS, you do see it, right? Because you are typically collecting data at 3 hertz, 4 hertz, 5 hertz, 10 hertz. So it's enough time for you to collect all these oscillations of the systolic and diastolic pressure of the brain, of all the uh, the, the, the heart rate pumping up. So it's, it's there. You can see it. Uh, and the fact that you can see it makes it easier for us to account for. But it's still, uh, uh, we need to find ways to deal with this, right? And I guess my point, I guess my main point is actually, it's it's fine if you can't remove that, but just be aware of this, right? Because uh, sometimes you are just not seeing what you want to see, right? So you may see a change that's correlated with the past, uh, but unless you really look for it, it may be a change related to blood flow and not a change related to, I don't know, the temporal cortex or the somatosensory cortex or things like that. Yeah. So there are ways you can remove this or at least account for this and minimize these contributions. Uh, so I guess my major advice is try to do that. Uh, but if you can't, just be aware of this and have this as a disclaimer. Great, Hickson. And uh, we'll just do just one more question from the YouTube chat. And uh, asking in, in the experiments, uh, if you use it, uh, machine learning to analyze the brain image, how much, how much, how much important is the use of machine learning to analyze this signal? Yeah, I guess a lot of people have questioned this now, right? Uh, because machine learning is very useful. And I, I for example, I, I, I coordinate one big project here, Unicamp related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. But uh, uh, what I'll tell you is that it doesn't help at all. And uh, there's one concern, it, it may improve the results, but it doesn't solve the problem, right? And there's one big fundamental concept about machine learning that people usually ignore, right? Machine learning is all about learning from past data, right? And your data has always, uh, whatever you're collecting with, with years, we will always have this contribution. So
So whatever you will learn with machine learning, we'll learn this contribution as well, right? So it's not trying to use machine learning to solve this issue will not help the fundamental problem. Will not solve the fundamental problem, right? Having said that, there's a lot of things that we can do with machine learning. We can use, uh, the experiment that I showed you where we're trying to uh, uh, identify the subject based on the resting state that needs to file, that was a machine learning, right? Although we, we recently just showed that you don't need machine learning to do this, right? Linear classifiers can perform better than machine learning in this experiment. But uh, uh, if you do the right thing, right? If you do the right processing. So, uh, so yeah, there is a lot that we can learn from machine learning and use machine learning from the data, but it will not solve fundament the fundamental problem because machine learning is all about reasoning with the data you have. And unless you already separated all the data you have, uh, it's not gonna work out. Great, Hickson. Thank you very much for your talk and answering the questions. We, we appreciate it a lot. And, and okay, so see you, see you later. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Okay, now we we are going to have our prepare for a second talk, and it's going to be with Juan Sato. Um, let's just prepare some things. Waiting for the connection with no sound. It's connecting. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Good, good. And so and I'm I'm going to introduce you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, João Ricardo Sasso is a professor at the University of Federal of ABC. For five years it was the coordinator of the Nucleo of cognitive, the core of cognition in complex systems, the strategic unit uh, of the Universal, uh, Federal University of ABC, ABC, that has the goal of really uh, performing activities in, in, in related to research, teaching, and uh, outreach in, in the Area of neuroscience and cognition. And current research line is direct, the interaction between neuroscience and uh, exact science, with the primary focus on the neural development, ne the neural basis of psychotic disorder and brain connectivity, and artificial intelligence and sig neural signal processing. He was a bachelor in statistics from uh, the University of São Paulo in 2002. And 
it, uh, it got a master in statistics from, from University of Sao Paulo and a doctor of also in statistics from University of Sao Paulo. And so, uh, Sato, uh, you can you, you share the, the, the slides? Yes, of course. If you just if you click share there on the screen. Uh, before uh, sharing my screen, I just would like to thank Daniel for his nice introduction and for the invitation to participate in this workshop. It's, it's really uh, a great honor for me. And uh, indeed, the uh, the presentation of Professor Wixon was very interesting and, and, and very insightful. I would try to add and contribute by showing some ideas of, uh, um, let's say, uh, more innovative experiments that could be uh, uh, carried out using the FNIRS technology, um, mostly in the field of of education okay and uh sorry daniel can you hear me well is the is, is the sound good for you C can you hear me ah, okay good uh, no, just checking <laughs> and uh yesterday i was discussing with uh, daniel if uh we could try to innovate in this presentation because since I was, I'm going to talk about education, um, I would like to try new new things, and I would like this 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 uh, talk to be more like uh, a discussion review, a meeting online than a, a, a lecture. Because, uh, well, you, you can have access to video lectures uh, online, and I believe the main advantage of these uh, live conferences is the interaction between the, the, the speaker and the participants. And also, I would like to know your opinion as well. It's very important for me. Okay? So, uh, let me try to share this. So, so Sato, yeah. Uh, do you want me to, to to send the the links to the forms you? Use? Ah, yeah. I I, I will uh, instruct you when to send the links. Okay. Yeah. So the idea is that uh, I will send uh, uh, questions for you. In, uh, um, Google Forms, so you can have an online interaction with it. Okay, so sh shall we start, Daniel? Okay, so uh, well, I, I, I'm not seeing you anymore because uh, I, I'm seeing my slides here. Uh, can you see the, the slides? Is it working? Yes. Uh, uh, let me just okay well um, as I said today I will uh, talk about the interface between neuroscience and education J just take uh, uh, uh. Okay. I'm just seeing the time and uh, well uh, my presentation will be uh, in English but the slides are in Portuguese okay so uh, so uh, the first question, uh, uh, Daniel, could you please post the quiz one in the chat? Mm, the first question I would like to, to do for you is why neuroscience can be, could be relevant in education? Um, so if you could post this, uh, I'm also looking here at the chat. I think there is um, a lag uh, between the, the 
presentation and the chat, but I, I hope it will work. Just to, uh, while you are asking this questionnaire, um, I will just talk a, a little bit about uh, where the university I work is the Federal University of the region of ADC in the neighborhood of Sao Paulo. So it has two campi in San Andre and San Bernardo Campo uh, cities. And we have uh, 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 this website uh, for if you are interested, we have a, 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 a course um, in neuroscience, also a graduate course in neuroscience and an interdisciplinary unit in applied neuroscience. You are welcome to visit our site and um, write me if uh, uh, I could, uh, if you have any questions. Okay, so let me just check. Uh, okay, we are on six responses, answers at the moment. I will just wait a little bit more. And uh, I will follow my presentation um, while you, you are uh, uh, answering. And we can see the, uh, all the, the, the results of the survey uh, together, okay? So, well, people talk a lot about uh, teaching neuroscience, neuroscience to the teachers and that this could be helpful to uh, regarding uh, 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 the education. But well, you know, uh, we have hippocampus and we know that hippocampus is uh, uh, linked with memory. It participates in memory, in, in many process in memory. But how this would affect the practice of the teacher? Will the teacher change his or her class because he know that the hippocampus is associated with memory. I, I, I don't think so. And uh, there is this discussion, really, how much neuroscience can contribute to education uh, in terms of uh, changes in the daily practice of the teacher. And uh, actually, there is this... Uh, let's say, old uh, uh, um, paper published by John Brewer uh, discussing this, that uh, uh, perhaps the, there's a the bridge between the education and the brain is too far. And he argues that uh, um, perhaps the insights of neuroscience education uh, should be more linked with uh, uh, cognitive psychology and not only with neurophysiology or neuroanatomy. Um, I think this is an interesting paper to read. And what does, from the side of the teachers or the, the educators, what do, mainly in elementary school, what do they expect from neuroscience? Um, this research was conducted by the group of Professor Maria Teresa and uh, they asked uh, uh, many uh, uh, teachers about uh, uh, these expectations and about the importance of the knowledge in, of physiology and anatomy uh, 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 and how this could impact in the, the classroom and also about neurobiology or neurodevelopment uh, um, and functions just like memory and learning. And by the, the, the answers, we can see that teachers really expect a lot from the neuroscientists. They uh, just like, uh, well, they, the neuroscientists will solve the problems uh, I have in the classroom and then the, my students <laughs> will learn. And uh, actually, perhaps this is, <laughs> this is not the case. Uh, 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 we are working on that. Uh, for example, have you ever heard about neuromyths? Um, uh, so, uh, Daniel, could you please post the, the link for quiz two? And now I will come back to the answers of quiz one. So, 
Okay, we have 17 responses. Uh, this was an open-ended question, but uh, most people think that it could improve educational theories or uh, uh, understand how we learn, uh, um, pedagogical interventions, uh, evidence-based, this is good. And um, because people from uh, education uh, uh, could have more knowledge about the brain. And uh, well, uh, I actually could share all these answers uh, with you to adapt the, uh, 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 um, the, the way we teach. And, and uh, as you see, most people think that uh, uh, learning more about neuroscience could really change uh, uh, how, how, we, how we teach. And uh, actually, if uh, Daniel, after uh, my talk, I will, I will send you these, these answers. And so uh, ever, since it is anonymous, it's just a public survey, uh, I think we can share uh, between uh, among us, okay? And so uh, there is the so-called neural myths that are as the name say, says, uh, myths about how new, uh, how the the brain uh, uh, knowledge could help education. Uh, uh, just for example, that well, we use only ten percent about of our brain, or that we have these learning sty styles: uh, left brain, right brain, or that children that listen Mozart. Uh, they uh, have a, a greater IQ and they are more intelligent. And, uh, well, uh, these are new myths, as I said, there are many discussions here uh, in some uh, good reference, just like this book of Daniel Willingham and uh, or his other books. But uh, it is interesting because somehow these neural myths they have a reason why they exist, because they try to, to fill the gap in the knowledge that the, the educators and the teachers uh, uh, have uh, in order to improve their, 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 uh, their pedagogical practice. And so I, I think uh, I totally agree with uh, Hickson that uh, we need to improve uh, 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 our acquisition and analysis methods, we need to understand better the physiology. But on the other hand, uh, I think we somehow, it is important uh, for the neuroscientists to, uh, with, you know, science-based uh, uh, um, approaches, try to fill this gap, uh, this anxiety that the teachers have. Okay, and of course, uh, uh, as I said, I, uh, I, I see this like a, a meeting. Uh, this, I just expressing my opinion, and please uh, feel, feel free to disagree. Uh, I think uh, disagreements are good as well. So, um, one example of an ex fMRI study that I think is interesting and can really impact on, uh, uh, on the uh, pedagogical practices, uh, but although they are uh, scarce in literature, uh, this is a study published in Nature Neuroscience from the group of Vinod Menon in Stanford, from Stanford. Um, and basically uh, uh, it studies uh, uh, arithmetical abilities in children. And, you know, uh, should we memorize the uh, time tables, the, the tabuada, or not? Uh, well, because or should we memorize mathematical facts just like uh, five plus three is eight without you know counting in our fingers or not? Is is it really important to 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 you know have this in the, the, the tip of the tongue or not? And interesting, uh, this paper shows that uh, usually the proportion of people, children, adolescent, adults, that uh, retrieve the, this information and that does the, does the counting, uh, it increases with age, uh, the, the retrieval. 
uh, of the, this information and decrease the counting. And uh, I've not uh, uh, included the images here, but uh, this is a neuroscience study, and they demonstrate that uh, uh, the children that uh, 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 do the counting, they have more activation in uh, 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 the um, prefrontal cortex. And the ones that does the retrieval, they activate more the hippocampus. So uh, we can argue, and this is a conjecture because we need to, uh, uh, this was not shown in this paper, but it suggests that perhaps if you are faster in retrieving the information, it's, it is, if the information is memorized, um, you can free researchers, researchers in your prefrontal cortex that you can use, you know, to understand a concept more deeply or, you know, have more cognitive resources to promote learning. And so uh, the, the, this is for me a, a very interesting study in, in uh, suggesting and in the, the points toward uh, 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 this, uh, this fact. And uh, well, and perhaps technology could be a bridge between the basic science and applications. Um, of course, uh, here uh, we are perhaps doing the inverse path uh, uh, suggested by Rickson, uh, because we are going to the end in direction to the basic research. Uh, but I, I think we need to go in both sides. The, 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 the basic researchers should go in direction to the application, and the application researchers should go uh, to the basic research as well. There must there should be a dialogue between them. So, um, okay. So uh, I will talk now more about uh, FNIR's applications. Um, Daniel, could you please uh, 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 post the, this uh, third quiz uh, in the chat? And I will uh, take a look here in the quiz too. So we had 20 responses. And the answer, the, the question was about the neural nets. Let's uh, understand better the profile of this audience. And so uh, most of you, 60%, have already uh, heard about neural nets. And this is good. Cool. Ah, um, perhaps you, you, you don't remember, but uh, my first uh, graduation was in statistics. So this is why I like data. I, I, I try to, to think in a data-driven uh, uh, way. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, of course, I will not talk about the basic, uh, 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 the foundations, neurophysiology about news because, well, Rickson is the man. And, and soon you will have also a lecture from Draulio, uh, yeah, the good friend Draulio, Yaraujo that will do the explanation in more detail about the hemodynamic coupling, I think. So I will just skip this part. But okay, let's skip this. But just remember that we have a, a, a source and detector of lights, and then we can combine this in a grid. And what we call a channel here uh, is the path between um, a source and um, a detector. Okay, so Daniel, could you please post the quiz four in the chat? So, uh, <laughs> why sh should we use FNIRS? Uh, in the beginning, well, I, I, I'm a guy from my first interaction with neuroscience was with fMRI. So when I, I heard about FNIRS in this for the first time. I just thought, well, is FNIRS, you know, a, a, a solution, uh, equipment for, you know, the, the poor researchers. Um, you know, we, we are in a developing country. You know that it's very hard to have funds into the research here in Brazil. But is it a solution for, for uh, uh, the researchers that have a limited budget, budget so they 
it's hard to pay for the fMRI exam. Um, my my first this was my first question when I uh, uh, heard about fMRIs, but then I changed the the the, the, the way I, I I think about it, and I, I will uh, uh, say it soon. Uh, after uh, you you um, feel this the squeeze, okay. But uh, let's come back to. I just would like to understand why I cannot see uh, uh, the chat here in my um, my mobile phone. Okay. Let's come back to quiz three. And uh, the question was, if you use, already use FNURs in your scientific research. And we also, again, we have 20 questions. And uh, why do you think? <laughs> why are you watching this presentation? And the question is that 70% uh, 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 went pretend uh, sorry, intend to use FNIRS for research. 50% uh, um, yes and no. Interesting. So uh, I think this is expected uh, uh, from um, audience in this kind of workshop. And I hope uh, um, this the, the talks would be... Uh, uh, um, Useful to you know motivate you to use this this uh, approach. Okay. Ah, sorry. Uh, I forgot to tell. <laughs> I'm at the moment. I'm working at elementary school, and they, they, well, you know, the kids are shouting everywhere uh, as in any other school. So my apologies for the the background noise. Okay. Uh, you will also hear some babies um, crying. Uh, well, as I said, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in applications, and this is why I'm here at this moment. So, uh, well, uh, why should we use uh, FNURS? Uh, apart from uh, the the costs of the, the equipment, uh, I thought that perhaps we could see uh, the applications in another way. Perhaps we could use FNIRS uh, instead of a replacement for fMRI regarding the costs, but it could be an alternative um, tool in cases in which uh, it would be very difficult or even unfeasible uh, to do the research, the data acquisition with fMRI. So in this first paper, we just explored uh, um, that perhaps we could use FNIRS in a more unconstrained uh, uh, protocols uh, that would be impossible to be, or, or, uh, 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 to be made in, in fMRI, just like you know, playing piano, uh, a real piano with the two hands or playing a, a, a table tennis, for example. Uh, of course, the, the, the choice of table tennis was uh, <laughs> strategic because uh, uh, the head uh, doesn't move so much uh, in, in the way we, we, we did it. So uh, and our conclusion was that the motion artifacts, of course, they exist. Uh, it, 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 there's no uh, 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 data acquisition without, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, which are bulletproof against motion artifacts. But we found that the, the, the artifacts were much more manageable than it, uh, we would expect it to be in uh, fMRI or even using EEG. But I, I will not talk so much about this study. Um, as I said, I will focus more on the education side. So, uh, Daniel, could you please the quiz five in the chat? So, coming back to education, what type of questions? Of course, with answers 
could be uh, 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 ans uh, uh, the questions that could be answered using neuroscience. Uh, there is a many other aspects, just like uh, 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 political or ad administrative um, perspectives. And of course, uh, that will not be uh, in our hands to change. But regarding neuroscience, what kind of questions do you think that could be relevant to change education? And, and I, I believe most of you are Brazilians, so if we focus in Brazil, well, what do you think? Let's come back to quiz four. So why use a news instead of fMRI? Let's see your opinion about this. So flexibility, uh, costs, and uh, uh, it's easy with children, uh, more uh, perhaps something regarding feasibility and costs, uh, something related to motion and interaction between participants, naturalistic experiments, uh, open source, uh, portability, um, uh, less sensitive to artifacts, um, uh, cerebrovascular uh, 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 um, measurements, it, it is less invasive, um, less invasive as well. Yeah, and this is one, one of the points, uh, children experiments, children was, were mentioned a lot here, and this was a reason why I also uh, um, uh, started using FNUs because, uh, at least for me, it, it was it, it is much more easy to convince a children to participate in an, in an experiment using FNUs than fMRI because fMRI is noisy and the environment is claustrophobic and uh, uh, you know it, it cannot move uh, uh, his or her head and. Uh, Perhaps th there is a good match between FMUs and education. Um, yeah, but good to know your, your opinion. Thank you for uh, for for participating. So, um, okay, what I will present here is some of our questions. Let's say our initial questions and some answers that we we had uh, until now, okay? And the first question was, uh, is there a brain correlate that could be detected uh, uh, by FNURs? Sensitive, would be sensitive to that, this brain change, uh, to suggest that something is being uh, learned. Uh, this was one of the first studies conducted by Rafael Heinze that uh, it was a very simple study. It was a block design um, with uh, um, a uh, rest alternating between rest and the task in which the subjects indicate, in this case adults, were pr practicing uh, arpeggios with the left hand. The, Participants have never played piano before. Not uh, 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 they, the profile uh, of the participant were with very uh, uh, or known uh, knowledge on, on music. So um, we just asked the, the 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 participants to to practice these three chords here and then uh, for 30 seconds, and then uh, the participant uh, filled uh, this, uh, a, question, a very quick questionnaire about the, the, the difficult in doing this, uh, 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 these, these chords, uh, which are, uh, well, four note chords and very easy. And interesting, it is, as I said, this is a very uh, preliminary study. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we found uh, that, uh, a significant activation in, in prefrontal cortex here. And if you, if we analyze the mean activation in this region across the trials, 
we see that it follows this uh, inverted U shape. Uh, and the uh, uh, oxyhemoglobin, uh, only looking to the oxyhemoglobin uh, concentration, and across the the the, 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 the trials, uh, actually across the blocks of the thirty second blocks. Uh, while the participants' performance in terms of uh, uh, playing the correct notes uh, increased, and the reported difficulty decreased. And we found this was interest, interesting finding because it, we could interpret this as the brain, you know, uh, 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 getting more efficient uh, uh, to do the task in which it can improve the performance. It, it, it is less difficult. And we also uh, uh, observe a decrease in the oxyhemoglobin concentration it, that could mirror uh, 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 less uh, 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 activation required by uh, uh, the pre prefrontal cortex. Another question we had was about, um, uh, well, uh, I'm also a teacher in elementary school, and uh, well, people said that a teacher already knows if this student will uh, um, you uh, uh, answer uh, specific questions correct uh, or wrong uh, in, in a test. Uh, can we, you know, be more objective and study this from a neuroscience perspective? This was the question we are, were trying to answer. Of course, here we were not trying to uh, demonstrate uh, anything regarding educational theories uh, or how the brain works. Uh, here we just would like to provide a, a proof of concept that we could explore this question and uh, using FNIRS. And this uh, is the uh, study of uh, Amanda uh, Ambiola. Uh, which was published in Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. And we use a combination of machine learning and FNIRS uh, during a video lecture to predict if a student would uh, 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 answer uh, correctly or not uh, a certain question. So the idea was, uh, well, this looks like a maybe sci-fi or black mirror uh, technology that uh, we try to predict behavior before it occurs. Uh, particularly, uh, there is this uh, movie, Minority Report. I will not discuss about this, but if you're interested, I, I, I recommend. But what we did was uh, uh, we presented a video lecture to uh, a, a group of participants. And uh, we also... Uh, asked, uh, included a quiz in this video lecture in which we know where the content, content um, applicable to answer uh, this question was presented. So we could use the hemodynamic states of the prefrontal cortex in many channels during the presentation of the content as a predictor if the subject, whether the subject uh, uh, answer these questions correctly or not. And we can do this uh, many times. And uh, in this case, we use uh, two machine learning techniques, uh, elastic nets, uh, particularly penalized logistic regression, specifically uh, uh, penalized logistic regression, and also random forests. And interestingly, uh, the channels uh, which were more relevant to do these predictions, uh, considering both uh, uh, oxyhemoglobin, uh, the oxyhemoglobin, were mostly at uh, 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 um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and medial uh, uh, prefrontal cortex, which we know that are regions uh, involved uh, in uh, executive function and cognitive control. Um, 
And the results was, uh, these are the ROC curves. Basically, is, this is a, a way that we, uh, we present results in, in machine learning studies. But if we were just guessing by chance, we would expect uh, this curve is uh, red uh, and green to follow the diagonal. And what we see it is that they are above the diagonal and uh, the accuracy was uh, around, uh, I cannot see this, uh, uh, 65 and 66 with each classifier. So uh, we could not predict the response uh, uh, in a deterministic way uh, with 500% of accuracy. Actually, it was low, uh, 65. But you know, I, I think this is reasonable. If, if, if we could predict it with 100%, probably we are doing something wrong. Uh, I don't think that would be possible. But we showed that this uh, uh, was a beyond chance using you know, conventional statistics, uh, p-values, et cetera. And uh, uh, we, we found that this, is, this was an interesting finding. And uh, uh, perhaps this could be linked to the attention that the subject was was uh, uh, was showing uh, during the content presentation of each question. Um, okay, S quiz six, please, Daniel. Could you post the quiz six here in the chat? I will come back to the quiz five, but so in. The quiz six is biological, from a biological perspective of the uh, teaching learning process, which aspect would, would you like to explore? Now let's come back to quiz five. And uh, the quiz five was about the type of questions uh, in order to improve education. Well, we had only 13 uh, response, but that, that's fine. Let's see. So uh, the, your answers were about different ways that learning, about learning and how to do uh, using the daily practice, something related to mechanisms related to attention memory, uh, uh, st strategies to boost uh, uh, learning and uh, uh, and teaching, um, uh, processing uh, speed when a, a, a person is studying. Yeah, studying is um, perhaps one of the most important points in education. Uh, not only the, the, the lecture or the, the teaching part, but the study part. And uh, why some people have more uh, uh, are easy to learn than others, even uh, than when the other uh, uh, study a lot. Something about the phonic matters for uh, um, for literacy and uh, and response to interventions. Cool. Uh, something about learning disorders. Okay. Well, in terms of of biological, from a biological perspective of teaching learning, um, we opted to use hyperscanning, using an in afternoons. And hyperscanning is the simultaneous acquisition of FNIRS, in this case, or EG or fMRI uh, signals, brain signals, when uh, 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 the, the uh, participants are interacting with each other. So we have the simultaneous acquisition in order to better understand this interaction. And uh, I will just present brief uh, results from this uh, study uh, published in Frontiers in Psychology, um, uh, exploring this, uh, uh, this issue. And our aim was of course, not to arrive in a real classroom, but move in the direction from the laboratory to the classroom. And uh, at least for us, the most <laughs> straightforward interaction to be explored 
is the interaction between the teacher and the student. So uh, here we use uh, a montage covering prefrontal cortex and the temporal parietal junction of both uh, uh, students and uh, the teacher. Uh, the teacher, uh, the, the, the kid uh, was three years old, so uh, very young, and the teacher was trying to teach the kid, uh, a girl, how to sum up the outcome of two dice. So they, they have this board game uh, and the, 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 the kid toss, uh, 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 tossed the two dice and uh, they, uh, sh uh, the kid had to sum up the outcomes to, uh, uh, um, to, um, to do the steps in this, this board game. And they, uh, of course, this was like a dialogue because it uh, um, was not a formal lecture, and it was more like a dialogue. And our hypothesis was that uh, we would observe a correlation or co-activation patterns between the student and the teacher in this case. Again, it's important to highlight that here we were not trying to prove any uh, educational theory or learning uh, theory, but we would like to introduce this idea that we could uh, uh, better investigate uh, 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 this uh, interaction uh, using FNIRS. And we were very uh, uh, happy that uh, this, uh, this paper is, has been uh, very cited by many researchers in uh, the, the science of learning and people are, uh, are conducting much more robust, very large group of students and teachers uh, uh, to investigate educational theories. So this was just, you know, as small kids, we, <laughs> we, we brewed uh, in the field. But interestingly, we indeed found this correlation between the things and uh, um, the prefrontal cortex of the child and the temporal parietal junction of the child. Interesting part is that the prefrontal cortex is involved in cognitive control and that Temporal parietal junction is also is, is involved in um, uh, mentalizing empathy, trying to understand the other, and this correlation uh, in this region uh, uh, from the teacher's side was re really interesting. So, um, as I said, this was just a, a very uh, initial study. And we increased this, uh, this was only a, a, a couple, um, a pair, and we uh, uh, acquired the data of more subjects to, in order to investigate better this, this phenomena. And in the work of Candida uh, Barreto, um, we applied machine learning techniques to try to predict the signals from the child, uh, of the child, using the signals of the teacher as a predictor. And uh, in this case, we evaluated uh, five, uh, five pairs, and we found that indeed it was possible to, uh, to predict uh, 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 the, the signals uh, in this direction as well, in both five. Uh, we prefer not to do, uh, you know, a group uh, uh, mean, uh, but to analyze each uh, pair, student, teacher, uh, uh, at each time, and we found uh, 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 this this direction. And uh, this uh, 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 study is uh, presented here in uh, in this paper. Um, we also, I, I will not enter in the methodological details for uh, these machine learning techniques. I think it's not the point of this, this talk and I'm already almost finishing, just almost finishing my time. 
Uh, but we can also explore uh, this data uh, using graph theory. Uh, this is a framework from mathematics to uh, mathematically uh, explore and understand uh, networks organization. So we can, may think that the two brains forms a single, only one big network with two sub networks, the sub network of the teacher and the students. And we would like to better understand how this sub network connects to, to this uh, other network. And this is uh, the current work uh, of Amanda. Uh, we are still finishing to analyze the data. Uh, but we, 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 we have some very interesting uh, uh, results uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we are trying to identify the brain regions that do this connection between the brains. We call this the betweenness between feature or characteristic of a given a node, in this case, a brain region here. Uh, finally, we, we conduct also a for students hyperscanning actually this was not a hyperscanning because the subjects were not interacting between each other but they were participating and attending to the same class presented by a teacher uh, it was a uh, this is at an university level and uh, it was a, a, a class about uh, epigenetics and we monitored the prefrontal cortex of four students while uh, 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 while attending this, participating in this class, in, in this class. And we study the temporal correlations among these four subjects. We, we, and we hypo hypothesized that we would find a correlation uh, between the four because they were present, they were being presented to the same stimuli. In this case, the classroom, and we uh, split the class in four uh, eight minutes, eight minutes uh, uh, sections, and we found this that the intersubject correlation in the first eight minutes was statistically different from zero. At sixty minutes, it decreased, and after sixty minutes, they <laughs> they were not correlated anymore. And of course, we can wonder why this would happen. Is this something related to arousal or attention or uh, perhaps uh, the interpretation of each other is different? I, I, we did, any of these uh, wonderings would be only conjectures. But again, we just would like to introduce this idea to show that we could, we could explore uh, uh, these questions using this technique. And of course, uh, when we conducted this study, uh, the FNIS technology and instrumentation was not uh, as accurate and good as it is now. Uh, I would change many things, including uh, accelerometers in the head of the participants and also uh, a short distance channels as pointed out by Rickson and uh, many other things. Um, finally, we can also combine eye tracking uh, with FNIRS uh, and, and simultaneously uh, investigate uh, uh, brain uh, uh, hemodynamic states and the pupil diameter or the, the gaze where the, 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 the uh, a student is, uh, 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 is uh, looking at uh, a presentation and uh, um, <clears throat> and do some analysis on this. This, again, was just a, a suggestion of a possible uh, application of the technology. Before I finish, I just would like to come back to quiz six. And the question was, well, there's no response to quiz six. Uh, okay, perhaps, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm just try to update here. Okay, no, we, we had, uh, oh, it was only a update. 
problem. <laughs> we had 17 questions, and let's see. Um, most of you pointed attention, blue. Uh, um, the, uh, new development um, uh, problems, and the other one was this. Uh, uh, learning disabilities and or cognitive load. Good. Uh, well, I don't know you, but I, I like this kind of... Uh, I really want to know what you think. Thank you for answering. And this was the final quiz. <laughs> And so uh, to finish, uh, I think this is this is the beginning of a conversation between FNIR's applications in education. So uh, it involves the uh, participation of many many fields from you know researchers and not only researchers but also. The, the teachers uh, uh, from elementary schools and, uh, and the neuroscientists and also the physicists or uh, the engineers. So this interdisciplinary um, work, I think is very, uh, for me that I like to interact with people, is very gratifying and I, I'm really happy with that. Mainly because uh, my opinion uh, we we have, uh, you know, uh, many things to improve education in Brazil, and this is a necessary condition if we want to improve uh, our country. And um, so, uh, thank you so much again for your invitation, Daniel. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you everyone for uh, watching and participating in this meeting and answering all these quiz. Thank you so much. I will just stop uh, my screen sharing. I just hope I am still online. <laughs> and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm very happy to answer. Thank you so much, Sato. That was a wonderful talk. It was a pleasure having you here. And we had some we had a question from the audience. And we would like to know when you present the the graph the the, the graph re results. Uh, what software do you use to to do graph analysis? Okay. You uh, we use some. Uh, we use the R platform for computational statistics, and uh, there are some, you know, some libraries to do the graph analysis in R. Um, why R? Well, because I'm a statistician and I like using R. But there are many other libraries for Python, or MATLAB, uh, if you wish. But I, I use. Uh, we use mostly the iGraph uh, package of our project. Can you say it again, the name? Sorry? Can you say, say it again, the name? Sorry, uh, th there was a problem in my connection. Just to, could you ask me again? <laughs> Wait. No. I, I was okay. I I grab. I I will put it. Yeah, on, the I grab exactly. Yeah. On the, the chat. It's like iPhone. Oh. I grab. I put it on the chat. Something like that, right? You can you see the chat? Yes. Yeah. Great. And we had a question from the chat, and so you could talk about something a uh, little about the challenges of doing research with preschools in Brazil. Um, what's the question? 
What? What is the question? Uh, asking you to talk about the challenges of uh, doing research with preschool in Brazil. I see, I see. Uh, well, there are so many questions that I don't know if I present them chronologically or alphabetically, <laughs> you know. But, um, well, first is that uh, even to explain um, the nature of the research to parents, because we, well, the, 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 the children, uh, uh, we would like the children to participate, they, they must accept it, but also the parents. And this kind of research is not, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, usual here in Brazil. So there are some, let's say, resistance from both the parents and the education secret secretaries uh, uh, here. Uh, usually, the way we found to minimize this resistance is you know is going there and talking personally to the uh, to the education secretary or and the parents and explain uh, what we are doing why we are doing this and show that uh, you know uh, it, it is non evasively um, and even for, for, for the children uh, we must show that you know it's only light the most common uh, um, fear from the, the, the children is that they will somehow be uh, uh, receive a, 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 a shock, uh, will be electrocuted electric, uh, uh, by the, the cables, you know. And so usually I just uh, use a, a fiber, uh, optical fibers to show that no, no this is only light, you know, there's no problem. And th th this would be uh, one challenge. The second is that Unfortunately, the dialogue between uh, uh, um, the, the, research, the researchers from education and from neuroscience is not so easy, you know, even because uh, there are some words that have different meanings in each field. For example, if you say learning, learning for education is completely different uh, 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 for a neuroscientist and an, an educator, uh, or even attention, you know. So uh, we are, I think, we are now trying to build this common language and interfaces uh, uh, to communicate with them. Because remember, we cannot do this research alone. We must the 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 participation of the, the educators as well, and. Um, and third, I think this is a problem <laughs> everywhere, but perhaps uh, is bigger in, in developing countries, is that the budget for research is, is, is very limited, you know. And, uh, well, if I had all, all the, the money, I would buy a MRI, a eye tracker, an ear, the EG, I, I would try to buy many things, but this is not a reality for most uh, uh, most uh, researchers in Brazil. And I, I, even more, if we want to have this dialogue with the applied areas, if the equipment are very, very expensive and the setup is very, very expensive, it's hard to escalate, you know, uh, uh, there, 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 there's no, it's very hard to be, you may, uh, you can make a difference in one school or two schools, but to make a difference uh, 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 you know, to a system is very hard. Uh, so this is why uh, instead, uh, well, my dream is to have uh, an FDRs in each school and do, there are many things we can do with that, but it's not a reality here, you know. So this is why we try to uh, investigate more general questions in which the knowledge could be disseminated and the knowledge 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 is scalable. I see something really 
hard drive, uh, both for the for dealing with the the, the children, right, during, in, during research, and to with the money, right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a very common problem. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Sato. That that was that were the questions we had. It was a really real pleasure having your your talk. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you for your invitation. The pleasure was mine. Thank you so much for your invitation. Obrigado pela participação de todos. Se você, Daniel, eu vou colocar aqui no chat, eu não sei se eu estou no slide, eu vou colocar aqui o meu e-mail, você posta ali no chat, por favor? Ok. Então, o meu e-mail de contato. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to write to me. Is, uh, as I said, I really like to, to interact with you. Wait, you, you, you type at something where? Yeah, in the, in the chat here is pretty high. The chat what? Stringer. Oh, Stringer. Ah, I see. Now I see. Okay, your email, right? Só copia para o YouTube, por favor. Okay, I'll, I'll put it. Okay. Your email, right? Okay, exatamente. Muito obrigado, viu? Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having your talk and, and all this interactivity that you brought during the talk. I hope it was not a As I said, this is something new. I yes. just hope you like it. <laughs> yes, it, it, was, it was great. Really great. And thank you very much. So, bye bye. Bye bye. And that's it for today, for today morning. We will have, uh, we continue the, the schedule in the afternoon at 1 p.m. And where we have the, the, the talks, what will, the presenters will be here at the Brain Institute and we will transmit it uh, to YouTube. Thank you very much. We are closing the transmission now.